Hey, good morning. I'm Pastor Greg Robertson. Always great to see all of you uh, in God's house this week. Hey, at Vacation Bible School this past week, we set a new world record in Rockingham County for most sugar eaten uh, in a Vacation Bible School ever. Uh, so if we sent your kids home all sugared up, I apologize. Uh, but man, there were so many uh, good, good things to eat this week. Uh, Wendy knows how to sugar us up, don't she? Oh my goodness, Swedish fish, Skittles, uh, man, these uh, candles they made uh, out of umpties, umpties. It was a pencil. Um, yeah. But hey, uh, just one other announcement uh, this morning. Uh, as you will remember, uh, back on the first Saturday of March, we held our uh, Feed the Hunger Packathon here at Growing Oaks, and we packed about 40,000 meals. We received an email this week from Feed the Hunger, and uh, our boxes, along with uh, other groups that have packed boxes, were uh, packed up onto a shipping container, and uh, that food is on its way to Liberia. Uh, ain't that amazing? Praise God. Uh, the food that was packed here at Growing Oaks is going to be distributed to five different schools as well as two orphanages. And uh, they wanted us to pray for safe travels for that food. Uh, there's still customs, and uh, when you go through customs, you've got to pay duties and fees. And they were praying that it wouldn't be so expensive, uh, so we're still praying for that food to get there. But uh, Liberia is a little country on the west coast of Africa, so it's kind of amazing. Uh, that's something that you did right here in this worship center center on a Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, is making an impact uh, in someone's life on the west coast of Africa. And uh, those meals that you pack feed children in orphanages or during school. Uh, so we pray not only for the physical sustenance, but we also pray for the spiritual work uh, that will be done in these children's lives as they hear the Bible taught and preach and receive a Bible. Uh, so it's a great, great ministry. And I'm so glad that we could be a part of that and do that ministry. Hey, if you got your Bibles with you this morning, I want you to head on over to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20. Uh, if you're old-fashioned and still use a paper Bible like me, if you've got a phone, uh, you can head on over to Matthew 20. Uh, I'm going to start where we were last week and just look real briefly at 2 Peter chapter 13, but most of our morning will be spent looking at Matthew's gospel chapter 20, and those words will appear on the screen behind me if you don't have a Bible or a phone. But before we look at our text this morning, let us pray. God, we do thank you for the work and ministry of Growing Oaks Community Church. And God, we pray for an outpouring God upon our church, Lord, for the work that you have called us to do in the Great Commission. Father, we pray as we come to the preaching of your word. God, I pray for those who will hear these words in person. God, I pray for those who might watch this sermon online. God, I pray for your Holy Spirit to speak through your words, Lord, and speak through the preaching of my word. God, we just give this all to you, Lord. We pray for a great supernatural work. God, may your word not return to you void. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you were here last week, you will remember that we looked only at 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, and this is what Peter writes. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So if you were here last week, you will remember uh, that these are Peter's final word of what we call 2 Peter. And they are words of blessing. They are words of benediction. But they are also a challenge that he is giving to his audience. That we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the word that I want to point out to you from that text is the word grow. And why that is so important for us to know is because the word grow is a present tense verb in the Greek language. And why that is so important for us to know is because a present tense verb in the Greek language means that is an ongoing and continual action. So when Peter says grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, what Peter is challenging us to do is that we must continually, on an ongoing basis, be growing not only in grace, but also in knowledge. 
And if you were here last week, you will know that we focused only upon growing in this idea of knowledge. And there are three ways that we grow through the revelation of God. Number one is what is called general revelation. And this means that God has revealed his invincible qualities through the way he has ordered and created creation. The second way that we looked at is what is called specific revelation. And specific revelation is the Bible. God tells us exactly who he is and what his will for is for our lives through what we call the word of God. So how do we specifically know that God is a God of love and grace and mercy and compassion, forgiveness and goodness? We know this because the Bible tells us so. And that is why we must be good students of the word of God. And finally, number three, we talked about incarnational revelation. And this is the fact that God, in the person of Jesus Christ, took on flesh and blood. So if you want to know what God is like, just study the life and ministry of Jesus. Because whenever you see Jesus, you are literally seeing the person and character and will of God. So this morning I want to focus on Peter's second word, and it is growing in grace. And where I want to look this morning is Matthew's gospel, chapter 20. Everybody loves a good story. It's why we like to watch movies. It's why we read books. It's why we tell jokes of stories. It's why we like to hear stories from people's lives. And the person who was the master storyteller was Jesus. And we call those stories parables. And through his parables, Jesus is teaching us not only about the character of God, but he's also teaching us about the will of God. And in 18 years of preaching, I have never preached this parable. And it is called the parable of the vineyard workers. And it is found in Matthew's gospel chapter 20. And we'll begin at verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard to work. So at the time of Jesus, the typical work day was 12 hours. It began at 6 a.m. and went all the way through to 6 o'clock p.m. So at 6 a.m., a wealthy landowner has gone and he has hired laborers to work in his vineyard. We pick up in verse 3. About the third hour, that would be 9 a.m., he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour, that's noon, and then the ninth hour, that's three o'clock in the afternoon, and did the same thing. At about the eleventh hour, five o'clock p.m., he went out and found others still standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour, five o'clock, came and each received the denarius. So when those came who were hired first, six a.m., they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. 
Now, if you were to read this parable simply on the surface, it would appear that Jesus is teaching a lesson that when we die or when Jesus comes again or when we all get to heaven, all of us will be paid equally. And there are some people who actually interpret this passage of Scripture that way. But I don't think that's the best reading and understanding of this parable. And the reason why I believe that is, is because if there is one writer in the Bible who speaks more about heavenly rewards, it is Matthew. Over and over and over in his gospel, he is constantly telling us that what you do with your time, what you do with your money, what you do with your spiritual gifts, what you do with the opportunities that God has given you, will be rewarded back to you in heaven. So no, we won't all be equal in heaven. What we do on earth will be rewarded to us in eternal life. So what is this parable actually about? I believe that this parable is actually about the extravagant and lavish and generous grace of God. That God doesn't work the way the world works. God gives his grace to people who do not to deserve it. So to illustrate this and to show us what type of God God really is, Jesus told a parable that the people in his culture would have easily understood. So at the time of Jesus, you had wealthy landowners who when it came time to bring in the harvest, would go into the surrounding towns and villages and they would hire what were called day laborers. And the equal wage or the fair wage, the minimum wage, so to say, at the time of Jesus was one denarius. So at 6 a.m., this wealthy landowner goes out into a town or village and he hires laborers to come and to bring in the harvest and he promises them, I will pay you the fair day's wage, one denarius. But as that landowner monitored the progress, he realized that they weren't going to get in the harvest that day. So at 9 a.m., he goes back into the village and hires more laborers to come into his vineyard. As he monitors the progress, he realizes we are not going to get this harvest in today. So at noon, he goes out and hires a third shift of workers. And as he monitors the progress, he realizes we are not going to get the harvest in. So at 3 o'clock, he hires a fourth shift of workers. And then finally, one hour between, before quitting time, he goes out and hires a fifth shift of workers at 5 o'clock p.m. And now the day is over, and it comes time to pay those laborers. And this is where Jesus adds the twist. And this is what Jesus says in verse 8. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages Notice this, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. Now, wait a second. That's not fair. That's not right. The day is over. It's time to pay the laborers. And the people who were hired at 5 o'clock p.m., those who only worked one hour, get paid first. What about everybody that started at 6 a.m.? They're at the end of the line. They had worked all day. They were sweaty. They were tired. They stunk. They stunk. Their feet ached. Their backs hurt. Their hands had blisters. Pay those who began at 5 o'clock first? That's not fair. That's not right. That's not the way things work in the world. So we pick up the text in verse 9 through 12. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came, and each received a denarius. So when those who came who were hired first, notice right here. They expected to receive more. 
But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last only worked one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. So now when the payments begin to be dispersed, when those who had worked all day, 12 hours, they see those who had only worked one hour, and they received a denarius, they begin to grumble against the landowner. That's not fair. This is not right. We worked all day in the heat, in the sun. We're tired. We gave all day. They got a point, right? This isn't fair. If you really wanted to be fair in this parable of Jesus, then those who worked one hour should receive one denarius. If you want to be fair, those who work three hours should then receive three denariuses. Those who work six hours should receive six. If you work nine hours, then you should receive nine. And because we work 12 hours, we should receive 12 denariuses for our full day of work. That's fair, right? That's how it should work. Now you can understand why the 12 a.m., 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., 12-hour shift folks were so upset because their sense of judgment, their sense of fairness had been offended. Here's the thing about this parable. Jesus is not teaching us about justice. Jesus is not teaching us about fairness. No, 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 no. Jesus is teaching us about something that is infinitely greater. The radical, extravagant, and generous grace of God. With the lavish grace of God, there is equal forgiveness, equal cleansing of sins, equal salvation, equal be see, being set free from the power of sin and death and the judgment of God. For those who are the recipients of God's generous grace, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Grace is a generous gift we receive, not an achievement we earn. So Jesus is right. God isn't fair because God is a gracious God. And the reason why we struggle with this is because we have a built-in desire for justice, fairness, achievement. You get what you earn. And if there is anywhere in the world where we are taught this from the time we are in kindergarten, it is America. Hard work gets rewarded. If you want to achieve, if you want to earn, if you want to experience the American dream, then roll up your sleeves and get to work. From the time we are small children, we are told in our culture that performance, hard work, success gets rewarded. But that's not the way that it works when it comes to God's generous grace. And what Jesus is saying in this parable is flying right in the face of what was taught in the religious culture of his day. If you want God to love you, if you want God to bless you, if you want God to save you, if you want God to answer your prayers, if you don't want God to punish you, if you don't want bad things to happen in your life, then you have got to earn and work for the grace and blessing and goodness and favor of God. But then Jesus comes on the scene and he starts talking about grace. Grace 
is the exact opposite of earning, achieving, performing, impressing. Because grace is not based upon what you do. It is based upon the goodness of God and the goodness of God alone. God graciously saves. God graciously forgives. God graciously blesses mess-ups and sinners who don't deserve his grace. Because guess what? Do you want God to be fair? Great. Hell for everyone, including you. The wages of sin is death. Show me in the Bible where it says that your wages earn you eternal life. The wages of sin is death. That's fair. That's just. That's what we all deserve. I don't know about you. I can only speak for myself today. But I don't want God to be fair. I don't want God to be just. Do you know what I want from God? The extravagant radical and generous grace of God because I am here to tell you I don't deserve it. So how do we grow in grace? How do we grow in grace? Let me give you at least two ways this morning. Number one is what I call relief. Relief. I think there is a warning in this parable that the longer that we are in the church, that the more we are at risk to become like the 6 a.m. worker. That the longer that we are in the church, that we become more religious and legalistic and entitled. And we begin to think that God owes me because I've read my Bible. I've prayed. I've come to church. I've given my money. I've worked for you, God, and you owe me. And what begins to happen in our lives is that we forget the generous grace of God. Christianity is not a works-based religion. So stop trying to be good through good churchy behavior. And would you also please do me a favor? Please stop thinking that because of your good behavior, that it will prevent God from allowing something bad to happen in your life. I'm sorry. But bad things happen to good people. And do you know what else? Good things happen to bad people. Do you know why that is? Because God isn't fair. It's because God is a generous and extravagant and radical God of grace. The good news of the extravagant grace of God is that you don't have to keep striving you don't have to keep working and earning to think that you are good enough so that then God will love you. The grace of God doesn't work that way. Jesus didn't die on the cross for you to live like this. Jesus didn't die on the cross for you to live paranoid that you have to keep looking over your shoulder as if God is some kind of sadistic and evil God who is just waiting for you to mess up so that he can punish you. My friend, let your heavenly Father love you. What a relief it is to know that I don't have to strive to impress God. He freely loves me. He is freely gracious to me. 
God's grace sets you free. And now because you are free, you can work in Jesus' vineyard in a spirit of gratitude, in a spirit of joy, in a spirit of grace, not in a spirit of duty or religion or guilt, but in a spirit of delight. Philip Yancey in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, says this, I grew up with an image of a mathematical God who weighed my good and bad deeds on a set of scales. I was always found wanting. Somehow I had missed the God of the Gospels, a God of mercy and generosity who keeps finding ways to shatter the relentless laws of ungrace. God tears up the mathematical tables and introduces the new math of grace. Grace means there is nothing I can do to make God love me more. And there is nothing I can do to make God love me less. Do you know what this means? Religious churchy people. Relief. You can stop striving. You can stop comparing. My friend, the pressure is off. And what a relief. And now you are free to love him and worship him and serve him and give your life to him freely. That is one way that we grow in the grace of God. It's relief. Here's the second way that we grow in grace. And it's a second word. It's release. Release. I think there is a warning in this parable. That the longer that we are in the church... That we are at risk for becoming like the 6 a.m. worker. Because now we begin to think that there are certain sinners. And there are certain sins that aren't worthy of God's grace like mine. In 1981, Robert, Ron, President Ronald Reagan appointed C. Everett Koop as Surgeon General. And when he was appointed to that position, he was a right-wing conservative evangelical. And that side, they praised the appointment. The conservative right-wing evangelicals praised C. Everett Koop. But oh boy, did the liberal mainstream media come out. And they were like a pack of wolves that tore him apart. But in a twist of irony... When C. Everett Koop left office, it was the right-wing evangelicals who attacked him, and it was the liberal mainstream media who praised him. One of the critical issues in the 1980s that C. Everett Koop had to address was AIDS. And in order for him to address that issue, he had to build bridges into the gay community. And it was through this bridge building that C. Everett Koop built a great friendship with a gay activist by the name of Mel White. And C. Everett Koop once received a letter from a critic that asked him this question. How can you possibly remain friends with a sinner like Mel White? And as C. Everett Koop thought about that criticism... As he thought about that question, the greatest biblical answer he could give was this. The question is not, how can you possibly remain friends with a sinner like Mel White? The real question is, how could Mel White possibly remain friends with a sinner like me?
if we want to grow in grace, it will mean that we will need to stop judging particular people and particular sins as if these particular people and these particular sins are worse than the sins that I commit myself. As if we are worthy of God's grace, but they aren't. Oh, but, but Pastor Greg, Mike is a junkie who because of his addiction destroyed his family. Bob murdered three innocent people. Jill had an abortion and murdered an unborn baby. Pastor John stole from his company. Lisa is an adulterer. Nancy is the biggest gossip in Rockingham County. Pastor Greg, these people don't deserve God's grace. What they deserve is God's judgment. Seriously. Do you think like that? Seriously. Do you honestly think that there are particular people and particular sins that are worthy of the judgment of God but yours aren't? Do you think this way? Do you know why this is? Because your hearts become churchy. See, I told you that the longer we're in the church, the more we become like the 6 a.m. worker. That because of my goodness, because I've worked, that I'm more deserving and worthy of the grace of God than other people are. I think this parable exposes our churchy attitudes. I think this parable exposes our churchy hearts. Let me tell you about John. At the age of 11, John became an apprentice on his father's ship. And as he found himself in this environment, John became a vile and wicked and evil person. And when that slave ship was hauling African slaves, the female slaves on that ship, yeah, they were there for the sexual pleasure of John. John's fellow sailors became so disgusted of him because he was such a vile and wicked and evil person. And even his own father became so angry at how vile and wicked and evil had become that he forced John to join the British Navy. But John wanted no part of the British Navy. So he tried to desert. He was captured convicted, stripped, and flogged. And then do you know what John became? Get this, a white slave. And he became the slave of a ship owner in Sierra Leone. But on March 9th, 1748, John boarded a ship for Britain. And to help pass the time, he just came across a Christian book that was on that ship. And as he began to read that book, he began to question, I wonder if these things are really true. On March 10th, 1748, the very next day, that ship found itself in a violent storm on the ocean. And all of the sailors, including John, thought, that the ship was going to sink and they were all going to drown. And it was because of that near-death experience that John began to read the Bible. And it was through his encounter with the Word of God that John repented of his sin, 
gave his life to Jesus and was saved. And for the next 40 years of his life, he would go on to become one of the most beloved pastors there was in England. And not only that, he also joined the fight against slavery. And it was because of his sin, it was because of his former way of life, the change that Jesus had brought to his life, that John wrote a song. But unfortunately, it didn't do real well on the charts. It, you've never heard it. You've never sung it. But it was only because of the extravagant grace of God that John Newton could ever write the song, Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. That, my friends, is the radical, extravagant, and generous grace of God. I want to close this morning with three invitations. And I want to introduce you to a third word that begins with the letter R. Repent. Are you tired of working? Are you tired of striving? Do you do what you do for God because you think it's going to prevent something bad from happening in your life? I have an invitation for you this morning. Repent. What you need in your life is relief. To just live in the joy and delight of the generous grace of God. My friends, are you guilty this morning of judging particular people and particular sins? I have a word of invitation for, for you as well. Repent. Release them. Do you know what you need in your heart? You need the grace of Jesus. You need the grace of God. My friends, this is growing in grace. There's one final invitation that I want to offer this morning. And I think it's a lesson that the 5 p.m. worker teaches us. It's never too late. As long as you have life, you have the opportunity. My friends, God is a patient God. All that matters at the end of your life is what you have done with Jesus. And if you're here this morning and you've never gotten your life right with God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, I pray that today would be the day of your salvation. Call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Acknowledge to Him that you are a sinner that you need his forgiveness, that you need his grace, that you need his salvation. Receive the free gift of his grace 
and be saved. All that matters when you stand before God is what you have done with Jesus. Repent. Come home to your Father and receive His generous grace. Let us pray. God, as we close out this service today, God, I just pray for your Holy Spirit to just give each and every one of us in this room a fresh touch of your radical, extravagant, and generous grace. God, we repent today of our churchy attitudes churchy hearts. God, forgive us. And I pray that you would give us a heart like Jesus, a man who is friends with tax collectors and sinners. Lord, I pray for everyone gathered here today. God, I pray for your blessing to be upon Bless them with your love. Bless them with your joy. Bless them with your peace, your goodness, your grace. God, fill us with the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. And God, I pray today for the work and ministry of Growing Oaks Community Church. God, we pray for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Jesus, we need you. Jesus, we cry out to you today. God, bless us. God, help us, Lord, in the work of your great commission. And God, we pray for Reedsville. We pray for Rockingham County. We pray for North Carolina. God, we pray for the United States of America. God, we pray for the millions upon millions of people the generous grace of Jesus. God, we pray for their salvation today. Draw them to the cross of Jesus. We pray for a revival in your church. Jesus, grow and build your church in the United States of America. God, bring in the sinners and the outcasts. And may we go to them and love them in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, help us. Pour out your good hand of favor today. We pray this and ask it in Christ's saving name. Amen.